Let us therefore turn to Hume. 1711 to 1776. The last, the most influential, the most consistent of the three famous British empiricists. In fact, he is so consistent, so rigorous about deducing the final consequences from the premises of Locke and Berkeley, that he represents a complete dead end philosophically. Now, if you think Berkeley's universe is strange, or Leibniz's, or Spinoza's, you haven't heard anything yet. I'll quote you an anticipatory summary of Hume from Bertrand Russell. Quote, it is important to discover whether there is any answer to Hume. I'm excerpting a paragraph. If not, there is no intellectual difference between sanity and insanity. The lunatic who believes that he is a poached egg is to be, con <laughs> is to be condemned solely on the ground that he is in a minority. <coughs> or rather, since we must not assume democracy, on the ground that the government does not agree with him. Notice, we can assume the omnipotence of the government. <coughs> and Russell concludes this paragraph, quote, this is a desperate point of view, and it must be hoped that there is some way of escaping from it, unquote, which he never found. Hume is the arch skeptic in philosophy. Now, I add for your edification that you can become even more skeptical of Hume than Hume by applying his conclusions even more rigorously. Now, you might wonder how you can become more skeptical than to reach the stage where you can't tell whether you are a poached egg or not. <laughs> the answer is in 20th century philosophy. The modern pragmatists and logical positivists, most of them are great admirers of Hume. He is their favorite, their top favorite among uh, historical philosophers. But they are really consistent. And they regard Hume as old-fashioned in certain ways, which he was. There's a limit to how much is possible even in the 18th century. <laughs> but you have to wait until you study contemporary philosophy for that. Hume is quite consistent enough for us this evening. Now, Hume's place in the history of philosophy is the final invalidation of reason. At least that's what people took it to mean. He comes to the conclusion that reason is impotent to give us any knowledge at all, and he claims to prove this position in reason. Now, all of the preceding philosophers, with a few exceptions, fell into two types. They were either philosophers like Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Locke, Berkeley. All of them claimed to be very pro-reason, regardless of their conclusions or interpretations. And on the other hand, there were the outright mystics, like uh, Tertullian, and we didn't mention Pascal, and people like uh, that who appealed blatantly to the faith, the heart, mystic revelation, etc. Now, Hume is the first modern philosopher in a major way to attack reason, like the mystics, but to do it in the name of reason. Now, of course, you may think Hobbes anticipated him, and he did, but Hobbes is really old-fashioned by comparison. Uh, to Hume. Hume is the first influential neo-mystic, meaning by that term the man who uses reason to invalidate reason. He dealt reason in the opinion of philosophers a philosophical knife blow, and then Kant came on the scene and finished it off permanently. Let's now look at Hume. Well, to begin with, Hume was an empiricist, of course. He does not believe in any innate ideas. He believes in the tabula rasa, experience is the source of all subsequent cognition. And in this respect, he follows Locke. We get from experience simple, unanalyzable, self-contained ideas, blue, rough, straight, loud, pain, will, etc. And then we form complex ideas, which we build up by putting together or compounding the simple ideas. Hume's name for the simple ideas is impressions. These are the direct, immediate, unanalyzable experiences. 
the units out of which all other cognitive elements are constructed. Now, to this extent, he is simply a direct follower of Locke. But now Hume takes a direction which we saw in Hobbes, which I mentioned in Locke, which I mentioned in Berkeley, and which I'm now going to emphasize in Hume. Hume declares that as an empiricist, you must be a nominalist. You must be a nominalist. And Hume is an arch-nominalist. Remember, nominalism is the rebellion against universals, either of the Platonic or the Aristotelian kind. A rebellion allegedly in the name of sense experience, empiricism, science. We don't say the nominalists perceive any such entities as manness, banananess, subwayhood, etc. There are no sharp lines in nature. Remember the borderline case. Everything blurs into everything else. <coughs> Consequently, if universals are supposed to be sharp, fixed, abstract entities that have some being in reality, they are myths. There are no such things. There are no universals. All there is is human naming procedures. On the basis of our observation of certain rough resemblances, we decide to call a group of particulars by the same name. But the only universal is the word or the name. Classification, I'm just reviewing for you, is an issue of our subjective convenience. And you recall this position is always associated with sensualism. Nominalism says there are no universals. Sensualism says then there is no such thing as the awareness of universals. In other words, there is no such thing as abstract ideas or concepts. All we have are percepts. This is a straight Hobbesian viewpoint. What we call an idea or a thought or a concept is only Remember the way Hobbes put it, a fading or decaying image of a sensory percept. The sensualist is the man who says that concepts are really ultimately only percepts. He's the man who takes sensory perception as the key to consciousness in every form and refuses to grant that conceptual consciousness is a distinct form of awareness. And this, of course, is done in the name of being empirical, scientific, anti-mystical. Now we've seen some consequences of, mist of the nominalism and sensualism. We, see, we saw in Hobbes the view that therefore classification is arbitrary, definition is arbitrary, general principles is arbitrary, and we finally ended up at Hobbes with the idea we have to have an absolute dictator to resolve disputes because uh, reason is helpless. But if you recall, when I presented Hobbes, I said he wasn't a consistent nominalist. Now you might wonder, how much more consistent can you be as a nominalist? You will soon see. The first thing then to recognize is that Hume is an extreme nominalist and sensualist. The only type of cognitive element that he recognizes are these direct experiential impressions. Now he grants that you can use the terminology idea as distinct from impression. But then you simply have to follow, in effect, Hobbes's idea. An idea is merely a faint copy, what we would call an image of an impression. It's equally concrete and specific. The only difference, says Hume, between a so-called abstract concept and a direct percept is the vividness, the intensity, the vibrancy of the percept as against the relative paleness and diffuseness and blurriness of the image. So if you want to have the thought of man just form a little blurred, unvibrant, unvivid image of a man, and that is the totality of the abstract idea or concept man, and so for all so-called ideas. Now, on the basis of this uh, nominalism, Hume formulates explicitly a principle implied by nominalism ever since its beginning, but never made as explicit as it was in Hume. And since he is explicit, he can be much more consistent about it than prior nominalists. This principle is a certain theory of meaning 
of meaning. Now let me just say a word about the meaning of meaning. The meaning of a term, as that is used in philosophy, is what it stands for, what it communicates, what it refers to. A term or a word or a phrase is said to be meaningful if it stands for something, if it has a referent, a referent, R-E-F-E-R-E-N-T, something that it stands for. Now, if I say, for instance, glass of water, I could point and say, there is the referent. That's what it stands for, and consequently, the phrase glass of water is meaningful. On the other hand, if I say gloop, and you say to me, what does it stand for? And I say, it has no referent. It stands for nothing. Then, obviously, it is meaningless. Now, if you are a sensualist, what reference can a term have? Obviously, only two possibilities. Either a direct sense experience, a direct sense percept, or the fading image of one. That's all. Because that's the only kind of cognitive element we're ever in contact with. And so we have a simple test to determine if any word or phrase is meaningful. Every meaningful word or phrase must be such that one can either directly perceive its referent or else form an image of its referent. I'll repeat that for you. Every meaningful word or phrase must be such that one can either directly perceive its referent or else form an image of its referent. This is known as sometimes called the empiricist theory of meaning, but more properly called the sensualist theory of meaning. It's called the empiricist theory because all empiricists after Hume, or almost all, are sensualists. And therefore, it's a, there's a very simple test. Somebody puts forward a word, you ask, can you perceive the referent? If the answer is no, can you form an image of the referent? If the answer is no, the word is noise. The word is like gloop. It's just simply empty sound, throw it out. Now you ask, can't a word stand for a concept as distinct from a percept or an image? And of course the answer is, on a sensualist philosophy, there is no such thing as a concept distinct from a percept or an image. Percepts and images is all we can ever know. And therefore, since our words must have reference, they can only be meaningful if they refer to percepts or images. Now let me give you an example. Take such a phrase as spatial extension, as apart now from color or tactile quality. In other words, think of it in the old sense of a primary quality, simply three-dimensionality. Can you have a percept of such spatial extension? apart from color and so on. No, you can't. Can you form an image of it? Well, that's just the test we tried under Barclay, and you can't, obviously. Then what conclusion will we come to? The phrase spatial extension is meaningless. It simply is noise. It's like the word gloop. It stands for nothing perceivable or imageable, and therefore is noise. Now, I have heard this applied by modern followers of Hume, for instance, to such a concept as electron. You can't perceive it. You can't form an image of it. And I have heard ample number of modern physicists declare that the concept electron, if used to designate some alleged real particle that's out there but that can't be perceived or imaged, is simply meaningless noise. Now, it's more common for philosophers of science to say this than for physicists, but I've heard it from both. This is an application of Hume's theory of meaning. Now, please understand this. Hume is not simply saying that all meaningful terms must be based on observation. Aristotle, of course, would say that. But on Aristotle's view, you could get the concept of electron, for instance, from observation by a process of abstraction and reasoning. Hume is saying 
any meaningful term must stand directly for a percept or an image. There are no concepts apart from uh, percepts or images. Now, this theory of meaning, this sensualist theory of meaning, is one of the most influential tenets on all 20th century philosophy, as those of you know who have taken any 20th century philosophy. And this theory of meaning was started in a major way by Hume. It represents the final outcome of nominalism and sensualism. And it's the key to the whole procedure of Hume's skepticism. His whole procedure is this. Every term he examines, he picks on some central philosophic term, and then he proceeds to ask, can you perceive its referent directly? You say no. Then he says, can you form an image of it? For instance, you can form an image of a golden mountain, so that's meaningful. But in the key terms that he produces for analysis, you can't. Then he says, it's noise, it's meaningless, throw it out. And thus you get the philosophy, a consistent philosophy, a pretty consistent, of a creature devoid of the capacity to form concepts. Now because of Hume's influence, it became much more popular around mid-20th century philosophy to denounce your opponent's ideas as meaningless instead of calling them false. You see, to say that an idea is meaningless is simply to dismiss it as even beneath falsehood. It's simply noise. If I come in the room and say, ish to triddle de glue glue, true or false, you'd say it's neither. It's just noise. In this respect, to say that your opponent's view is false is already thought by these people to be a compliment because you're at least saying his ideas are meaningful. They say something, even if false. Uh, the modern Humean viewpoint was, there was a big vogue of it, it's passing now, but there was a big vogue of simply dismissing every viewpoint as meaningless, and therefore you didn't even reach the question whether it was true or false. Now, some of them went so far as to say, I'm going now in the 20th century just to give you an idea of how far this can go, what do you mean by the word meaning or meaningful? Can you perceive a meaning? What color is it? Can you form an image of it? Well, then it must be meaningless. The word meaningful must be meaningless. Now that, you see, is as consistent as you can get. Now a gentleman in the 20th century named Wittgenstein wrote a whole book and at the end of it, he discovered that he had proved that he could not meaningfully say most of what he had said in the book by the very definition of meaning which he gave in the book. So he stopped. <laughs> and he ended his book on the sentence, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must remain silent. Now, in effect, he had a kind of mystic experience that certain things are meaningful and other things are not, and uh, he couldn't proceed any further to put it into words. Now, this has embarrassed many of his followers, and they evade all over the place. Uh, that's beyond our scope now. That's the 20th century. Let's go back to Hume. Let us take some key terms and see if they can withstand the application of this Humean theory of meaning. Let's take the expression external world or external reality and see if it has any meaning. Now you know that all philosophers prior to Hume or most of them believed that we do not directly perceive an external world, we only perceive our own experiences. We have no direct access to an external world but they believed it must exist as the cause of our experiences. That's the causal theory of perception, and Hume agrees we only directly experience our experiences. In this respect, he, like Berkeley and Locke, are all in the tradition of Descartes. <coughs> but now, he says, let us apply the theory of meaning, given this premise. Let us apply the theory of meaning to the phrase external world. What do people mean by the expression external world? Well, he says, they mean two things together. In one, 
The external world is supposed to be something apart from our experiences, something distinct from our experiences. And two, it's supposed to be something which continues in existence even when no one experiences it. So those are the two criteria of an external world, something distinct from our experience and something which is continuous, which goes on existing whether we experience it or not. That's what's meant in saying reality or the world is external to us. Now let's take each of these in turn. Can you perceive something distinct from your experiences? Perceive. Well, not if you accept Descartes' view that all you perceive is your experiences. Obviously, you can only perceive your own experiences. You can't perceive something distinct from your experiences if you accept Descartes and Locke's view. What then happens to the words distinct from experience? Since you don't perceive anything distinct from experience, the phrase distinct from experience has no referent. Nothing that you can perceive, it must become meaningless. What about the idea of continuity, of something existing when you are not perceiving it? Well, can you perceive something existing when you're not perceiving it? Obviously not. And of course, if you're perceiving something, you're perceiving it. So you're not perceiving it existing when you don't perceive it. Remember the lamppost and the drunk trying to find it. In other words, both of these terms end up as meaningless. We have no percept of something distinct from our experiences. We perceive only our experiences. We have no percept of something existing when we don't perceive it. We only perceive when we perceive. And therefore, perceptually, we have no referent for either ingredient of the phrase external world. But if we have no perceptual referent by the theory of meaning, the phrase is meaningless. And therefore, the phrase external world is simply noise. Simply noise. Now, if you try to answer, Hugh, and say, but look, after all, inherent in the very concept of existence and consciousness is the distinctness and continuity of existence. And if you then proceed, look, existence exists. Consciousness is the faculty for perceiving it. ASA, the law of identity. Now just grasp these concepts and you will see you won't get any farther than that. And Hume will say to you, concepts? What are you talking about? All we have are percepts and images. I don't perceive existence apart from consciousness, and that's true. You don't perceive when you're not perceiving. Consequently, on nominalist grounds, Hume would refuse even to hear any such argument. Now Hume asks himself, why is it since uh, external world is a meaningless fantastic idea. Why do people think there is an external world? It's a fantastic belief from his point of view. There's more evidence for a Santa Claus on Hume's philosophy than there is for an external world. At least we see people dressed up as Santa Claus, but we never come into any contact with something distinct from our experience. His answer to why people entertain this fantastic hypothesis, fantastic in his opinion, is that our experiences seem to show a certain constancy. For instance, look at this lecture. Now look away for an instant, perhaps at your fingertip, uh, and then look back. Now if you don't pay strict attention, or blink your eyes and you get a sudden shot of blackness, you see, and then you open it again and see the lectern. If you don't pay strict attention to the procession of your experiences, to the fact that they're constantly interrupted. If uh, you don't focus on those interruptions, you will tend to glide from one frame to the next without grasping the cuts, the holes, the breaks from second to second. The result is, since we're all intellectually lazy, according to Hume, we tend to fill in the interval between these experiences. It isn't real to us that there are all these cuts, because we're too lazy. 
We imagine that the thing, the lectern, is still there between our experiences, and therefore that it is distinct from our experiences. But that's simply a product of what Hume calls our imaginations. Our imaginations are lazy. They have a tendency to fill in the gaps. They invent fictions. But, says Hume, my point is, it is a fiction. If we go by direct experience, we have simply a series of discrete experiences and no evidence for continuing entities. The idea of an external world, in a word, is a meaningless myth. All right, let us continue with Hume. Having gotten rid of the material world, clearly there can be no external material entities in the universe, no material substances in the traditional terminology. But Hume is not content with the attack I've given so far on material entities. He launches an independent one, and I now want to turn to this one. Do we, he asks, have any evidence of material entities or substances? He proceeds to answer no on the basis of Locke's premise. The scenario is always the same. You start with Locke and then show the disaster that follows. Locke had said a material entity is a collection or bundle of qualities of simple ideas inhering in a substratum. And the substratum was supposed to be what ties the qualities together, what makes it one unified entity. Otherwise, Locke reasoned, these self-contained qualities could exist by themselves and separate and uh, disintegrate. But we build up entities by recognizing that these uh, uh, independent qualities are kept together in a substratum of such a nature that I know not what it is. Barclay, if you recall, blasted this substratum as lacking any identity and therefore being out. Hume agrees. The substratum is gone. And of course, on this point, they're obviously correct. The, the, the destruction of the substratum idea is not an issue of being a nominalist or a sensualist. We don't even have any concept, let alone percept or image of the substratum. It has no identity at all. It's nothing in particular, so it's perfectly valid to reject it. Well then, what would Hume say in answer to Locke's question, what does keep these bundle of qualities together? What is the thing that integrates qualities into entities? Why are there recurring combinations of identical qualities? Well, Barclay's answer was, God arranges it that way. He feeds us our experiences in that order. In Hume, as you'll see, God is out. So he has a simple answer. If you are in a position where something is inexplicable, on your premises, simply deny it. Hume says there are no recurring bundles of the same qualities. In fact, the qualities constantly change partners, so we have no problem. There is, says Hume, no reason why the qualities that happen to go together now to make up what we call a material entity, a wristwatch or a cigarette or whichever, should not suddenly split apart, disintegrate, so that instead of an entity, we have merely a succession of disjointed separate qualities. You remember the example I gave you last week? Well, Hume would say, he didn't use that example, but he would say there's nothing to prevent the qualities that make up a cigarette from suddenly splitting apart from each other and showing up in different parts of this room. So that the white color might travel to the rear without tactile qualities, without temperature. And over here, where the tape recorders are, would be the texture, a nice smooth texture, but you'd see nothing. And uh, over on my left, a hot burning point, devoid of texture, color, etc. Now, according to Hume, this state of affairs is perfectly possible. What we call an entity is simply a cluster of independent qualities, which happen to go along together for a while. But they just happen to, that's all. We simply have a bundle of qualities, a loose collection that can at any instant disintegrate and leave us in a universe of 
floating qualities without things or entities at all. Now, says so Hume, this is not just a theoretical projection. It actually happens all the time. It's simply that people do not pay careful attention. We never perceive enduring entities, he says. Only constantly shifting sets or bundles of qualities, constantly changing their partners. Suppose, for instance, I'm walking down the street looking at a building. Now, most people believe that this represents a certain enduring combination of qualities, that they can look at it, look away, look back, see the same set, the same size, the same shape, the same color, etc. Hume says if you go by actual experience, you don't see the same set of qualities each time. You see a new bundle each time you look. As you get closer, for instance, you see something bigger. The sun comes out. You see a different color. You get a different perspective. You see a somewhat different shape. You pass by under the building and look up. You see a radically different shape. Your eye goes up to the very top, to the spire, and you get a completely different experience than when you were looking down at the base, etc. What we really experience, says Hume, is a succession of different bundles of qualities, constantly changing. What we call the entity is really a loose collection of shifting qualities. Now, of course, you will want to object at once and say, isn't Hume confusing two entirely different things? The entity which endures and our changing forms of perceiving it, our changing perspectives on it. And you will want to object the entity is one thing. It is what it is. It's not affected by our varying perceptual conditions. And so you'd say all you have to do to answer Hume and discover a stable entity in reality is abstract away from our changing experiences and form a concept of the entity as it is independent of our varying forms of perceiving. But of course, if you said that to Hume, you know that his sensualism would forbid it. Abstract away, he would say, form a concept. There are no such things. All we have, all we can know is the stream of sense data that goes by before our nose. And even our nose is a temporary union of sense data. If this stream constantly changes, if we don't sense an enduring entity, then there's no basis for an enduring entity. If we go by sense data alone, we must conclude there are no such entities. There's simply a Heraclitian flux of sense qualities, constantly changing, shifting, appearing, disappearing. What we really experience is a succession of different bundles each closely related to the previous, of course, but nevertheless different. Therefore, we don't need a substratum to tie them together. What we call an entity is simply a name for a loose collection of qualities, constantly changing partners. Why do you have the illusion that you see the identical entity enduring across time? Because the various bundles, moment by moment, have a rough resemblance to each other. And again, you, your imagination is lazy. It fills in the gaps. It doesn't pay any attention to the actual difference. It imagines that it sees the same enduring entity. But this is simply a reflection of the laziness of your imagination. Now, I've indicated to you where Hume is wrong on this point, and that if you're able to rise to the conceptual level, you can defend the view of enduring entities apart from our changing perceptions. He is here drawing the final conclusions from Locke's viewpoint. But we still have Locke's original question to answer, so let's leave Hume for a moment. And Locke's question, if he heard this much, would be, well, why? What keeps the qualities of a thing together? After all, Locke would say, we directly perceive only these little atomic simple qualities. Something must keep them together. And if it's not the I know not what, what is it? Now the answer is, 
that if you grant Locke's premise that what we directly perceive are these little atomic self-contained qualities, you are in bad trouble. Then you do need a metaphysical glue to integrate them. But the thing is, you must contest Locke's premise. Now the truth is that we do not observe any such thing as atomic self-contained simple qualities. We do not observe loose collections of independent qualities at all. Now, if we're going to be empiricists, we should be honest empiricists. That is to say, true to the actual observed facts. And if we go by the actual observed facts, we will see that we directly observe entities, integrated entities. The separation from an entity of its various qualities is a work of analysis that human beings perform after they have first experienced the integrated entity. Now you consider an experience of an apple, for instance. Do you as an adult separately observe a simple redness and a roundness and a smoothness and a shininess, etc., etc., and then put them all together? No, you do not. You directly observe an apple, the integrated totality of these qualities. And only later, by an act of selective attention, can you focus on this quality or that one apart from the rest. The world of direct experience is a world of directly given entities. Individual qualities are not the starting points of experience. They are much later stages of abstraction from what we experience. And you must remember that an abstraction, a mental separation, cannot exist in reality apart from the thing which it's abstracted from. You can think of a certain quality apart from the others that it goes with in reality, only by mentally ignoring its accompaniments. But you must remember that in reality, it is inextricably connected to its accompaniments. Locke's procedure is therefore this. In actual fact, first he perceives the entity. Then he abstracts the qualities. Then he makes his individual qualities, which in fact are separable only in thought, separable in reality. And then he has the impossible problem of trying to put them back together again. Now, the fact is that no glue and no unknowable substratum is necessary to preserve an integrated material entity. The qualities, to put it simply, do not have to be put back together because in reality they never were apart. Now, what caused Locke's confusion on this point? The answer is that Locke confused two different levels of consciousness that I haven't yet mentioned in this course. And because it's an important issue, I want to comment at least briefly. There are actually three different levels of human consciousness. We've been talking throughout this course of perception and conception. But it's time now to mention the third, namely sensation. And I want to distinguish, therefore, perception from sensation, the perceptual level of consciousness from the sensory level of consciousness. Now, as babies, at the beginning, it's true that we do start on the sensory level, which is the first chronologically, the lowest level of consciousness. We don't perceive entities or objects immediately as babies. We're merely bombarded with disconnected sensations. We reach the next stage of knowledge, the perceptual level, when our brain has learned to integrate this disconnected, unintelligible bombardment of sensations into solid, integrated entities. Apple, mother, bed, etc. That stage is the perceptual stage. And then we are ready, after a certain accumulation of knowledge, to pass on by a process of abstraction and concept formation to the conceptual stage. So Locke is right in one respect. At one point in the past, we did get from reality a disconnected bombardment of sensations. But the crucial thing is that we do not now get such a dis bombardment, and we cannot. If we are now conscious thinking men, to say nothing of philosophers, we start at the perceptual stage at the stage of perceiving entities, we no longer experience the sensory stage. 
You know, you might ask, how do we even know then that it once existed? And the answer is only by inference, by a process of complex reasoning. When we get to the conceptual stage, we discover that we have means of perception. We discover that certain information comes from our eyes and some from our fingertips and some from our ears and so on. And then we realize that at one time, as babies, we must have got a disconnected set of data that our brain had to learn to integrate. But we can't now experience that baby's disintegrated state. We can only infer that something like it must have existed. And the crucial point is our inference depends on and is based on and starts from our present perception of entities. So there are the three levels, the sensory, the perceptual, the conceptual. In the order of time, you have the sensory, then the perceptual, then the conceptual. But in terms of conscious experience, where we have to start as thinkers and philosophers, the first stage is the perceptual stage. Then, we simultaneously go forward to the conceptual stage, and then, having developed a conceptual apparatus, we infer back to the existence of the sensory stage. But we can only infer back by abstracting from our perceptions, our perceptions of entities. In this sense, the existence and the direct perception of entities is a prerequisite of discovering the sensation stage. Now, you have to keep clearly in mind the difference between these three levels of consciousness and not confuse them. If you equate the perceptual with the sensory, then you are in Locke's position. You have a whole set of disjointed sensations and you need some unintelligible glue to stick them together. If you equate the conceptual with the perceptual, then you are in the nominal essentialist position. And you know the catastrophe implicit in that. And if you do both of those things, so that the conceptual equals the perceptual equals the sensational, then you are in Hume's position. You are left literally in the state of a newborn babe or a low insect. I say low because the higher animals at least have the, less, uh, the perceptual level. You are left in the stage where you are bombarded with disconnected sensations, unable to integrate them into entities, unable to form concepts, lost in a hopeless, chaotic, unintelligible, disconnected jumble, namely the universe of Hume. In this respect, Hume represents the absolute disintegration of human consciousness into atomic disconnected sensations. Well, so much for what is wrong with Hume on this point. We've been talking so far about material entities. What is Hume's view of spiritual entities, of the soul, the mind, the self? Well, Berkeley, as you know, had also gotten rid of material entities, but he had clung to the self. The thing which does the thinking, has the experiences, and so on. And he had claimed to have a notion of that, even if not an idea. Well, Hume does not have Berkeley's religious axe to grind. So he proceeds to demolish the self as easily as he demolished the material entities, given Locke's premises. Hume simply asks, what is this self? that everyone is talking about. Let me introspect and see if I can find it. Now, what is it supposed to be? It's supposed to be something distinct from my experiences, from my wishes, my thoughts, my beliefs. It's supposed to be that which has the experiences, that which does the thinking, does the wishing, does the belief. And it's supposed to be something unchanging something which remains the same and constitutes our personal identity. After all, our thoughts, our experience, our emotions, our mental content constantly changes. But the basic I or ego or self is supposed to be unchanging. Well, let me see if I can catch it perceptually, says Hume. And now I quote you his report on his introspective hunt for the self. Quote, for my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, 
I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never can catch myself at any time without a perception and never can observe anything but the perception. If anyone, upon serious and unprejudiced reflection, thinks he has a different notion of himself, I must confess I can reason no longer with him. All I can allow him is, and this of course is sarcasm on his part, all I can allow him is that he may be right as well as I, and that we are essentially different in this respect. He may perhaps perceive something simple and continued, which he calls himself, but I am sure there is no such principle in me. But setting aside some metaphysicians of this kind, I may venture to affirm of the rest of mankind that they are nothing but a bundle or a collection of different perceptions which succeed each other with an inconceivable rapidity and are in a perpetual flux and movement." Unquote. That is the famous passage in which Hume proposes to demolish the self. The word self is a meaningless term because it stands for nothing we can experience. When we perceive introspectively, all we perceive is a collection of individual experiences, thoughts, feelings, etc. We have no contact, says Hume, with an unchanging I underneath all of these experiences, which has them. And therefore, there is no meaning in referring to such an I or self. No perceptual referent, no image, meaningless. Personal identity is therefore a myth. I am a flux of ever-changing experiences, and so are you. We are each a bundle of experiences. This is sometimes called the bundle theory of the self. Now again, what is the explanation for the belief in this myth? Well, it's our imaginations which delude us. Because one state of consciousness merges smoothly into the next, there are always great resemblances between the content of your consciousness at any one instant and its content at the next instant. And therefore, we don't pay attention to the differences. Our imagination smooths things over by inventing the fiction of an enduring self-same entity or self. But this is a fiction. If you attend closely, introspectively, you see only a succession of different states, different psychological states. That's all. You're just a loose bundle, psychologically. Well, what's wrong with this one? Well, of course, the objections to it are legion. I can't resist pointing out the stolen concept. Did you hear his formulation? When I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble. I do all these things and there is no I. He's using the self to deny the self. But what's the basic error? Again, it is his sensualism and nominalism. What, after all, is the self? Now, I'm here now speaking from the point of view of objectivism. The self is your consciousness, your faculty of awareness, the entity which perceives reality. Why can't Hume find it? What does he want? Well, since he's a sensualist, he's upset that he never finds a percept of pure consciousness. He always finds consciousness of this or that content. He never perceives consciousness except with some content. And since the content is always changing, he bewails the fact that he never perceives an unchanging pure consciousness. Well, what does he want? To perceive consciousness without any content. Well, of course, you're never going to do that. By the very nature of consciousness, consciousness is the faculty for perceiving something, for perceiving some content, some object. A consciousness without a content, a consciousness conscious of nothing, is literally a contradiction in terms. Now, how, in fact, do we arrive at the awareness of our consciousness or self as distinct from its changing contents? 
again, only conceptually, by a process of abstraction. We abstract away the various contents and focus simply on the fact of conceptual awareness, the entity which is consciousness. In other words, we ignore the contents and arrive at an awareness of our faculty of consciousness as such, that which does the thinking, makes the connections, feels the emotions, etc. But consciousness, of course, can't exist in fact except as consciousness of something. And so you cannot perceive consciousness except perceiving it as consciousness of something. Now, if, like Hume, you deny the conceptual level, you will, of course, never find an enduring self-same consciousness or self. You'll find only a string of conscious experiences. You'll always catch consciousness occupied with some content or other. And since the content is always changing, you will moan, where is the unchanging I? Where is my personal identity amidst all this flux? When the fact is that it is really very simple. It's easy. You do directly experience your I, your consciousness. But in order to identify it and defend its existence, you must reach the conceptual level to which human principle never ascended. Is the issue of meaningful versus meaningless terms, as used by philosophers, valid? I.e., is the standard of the existence of a referent for meaningfulness valid? Well, here you have to untangle many things, but to be brief. Yes, certainly, a meaningful term has to stand for something. In that respect, it must have a referent. That's correct, otherwise it would stand for nothing, it would be meaningless. But the crucial point is the referent does not have to be perceivable as long as it is conceivable. In other words, in a valid philosophy, a term is meaningful if it stands for something to which the human mind can have cognitive contact or relationship. But that contact does not have to be restricted to sense perception or images. There are many things that we cannot know by direct perception, which we can know by conceptual means. Concepts, of course, being themselves ultimately derived from percepts, but not being the same as percepts. And in this respect, I would say a term is meaningful if it has a referent, which is either perceivable or conceptually definable. As to the broader issue, no, I do not believe that the criterion of meaning if you want it more specific than what I've just given you, is a valid philosophic question. It's a question which arose only under the influx of a wave of nominalism and sensualism, which led philosophers to the conclusion that three quarters, if not more, of the issues that had traditionally been discussed were meaningless. And so they got off on this wild kick of what does meaningfulness consist of and forgot about the questions. As an objectivist, I take the view that the definition of meaningfulness, beyond the brief account I gave you here, is not a legitimate philosophic question. If a statement does not consist of undefined terms or does not violate the, term, the laws of grammar, it is meaningful. Uh, if you say the cow land up, that's meaningless. If you say the gloop hit the triddle, that's meaningless. But if you say the cow hit the frying pan, that is meaningful. <laughs> because the terms are defined and the grammar is English, or whatever language you're speaking. It is not the province of philosophers to become lexicographers, contrary to modern trends. If Hume says that the meaning of a concept or a word is its reference, how can he accept the analytic-synthetic distinction which depends on distinguishing meaning and reference? Well, let me bypass what Hume says on that and tell you what his modern followers say. And they say you must distinguish two different kinds of meaning. If a term is supposed to be, quote, factual, that is, refer to actual experience, then it must have a referent in actual experience. But on the other hand, if a term is being used as part of what Hume calls a relation of ideas, then its meaning is entirely different. It is meaningful if you equate it with other words. So, for instance, if I say a bachelor, 
is an unmarried male. The meaning of the word bachelor is the phrase unmarried male, all of it. A little world of definitions cut off entirely from reality. That's what's called semantic meaning by many philosophers and is contrasted with factual meaning. Of course, there is no such phenomenon as semantic meaning in this sense, speaking rationally. Uh, but uh, then if you were to speak rationally, you wouldn't accept the analytic synthetic distinction. But in other words, they said there's two kinds of meaning. Some terms are meaningful because they relate directly to experience. Some terms are meaningful because we build them into a web of constructs, arbitrary definitions, and their meaning is the arbitrary definition we give. How can Hume claim that his is a philosophy of reason when he claims to be an arch-empiricist and is against reason on principle? Well, I'm not sure that the intention of this question is clear. An empiricist, if that term is used very broadly, is not somebody who denies reason. It's somebody who declares that reason must take its point of departure from experience rather than build upon innate ideas. Now, in that sense, the fact of saying you're an empiricist doesn't mean you're against reason. Now, Hume, of course, derives from empiricism, sensualism, and nominalism, and skepticism. And in that sense, ends up being against reason. Uh, but uh, it's not simply from being an empiricist, but from the particular interpretation which he puts forth. And, of course, he would say, I'm not against reason. My whole philosophy is perfectly rational. I've given the rational proof that reason is hopeless. 